We are here back with you in a series called Hall of Faith. And the series is walking through Hebrews chapter 11. And it's a whole listing of Testament uh, uh, characters from the Old Testament who are real people in real faith struggles. And it's real messy. And I, I know it's been an encouraging for me as I've gone back and read through the life of Joseph. And last week we talked about Moses. And so actually we're going to be in Exodus chapter 18 this week. If you want to turn in your Bibles to there, uh, we were going to be talking about Moses' life and some things that we can learn from it today. But one of the perspectives we haven't told you is that Hebrews 11 is followed by Hebrews 12. And in Hebrews 12 it says, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, we need to run the race that's set before us. And if you can imagine, Moses, with all of his history of faith and trust in God, is watching us right here at Family Church, right here in the COVID crisis, and he's saying, trust in God, keep going, this is gonna, God will bring you through it. So it's important that we see these people not only as real, but as present in our current struggle. And there's one piece of Moses' life that we didn't talk about last week, and I really want to back up and hit it because it is so important for us as a church, for us as individuals, and I think it's particularly uh, relevant in this time frame. So we're going to talk about a new paradigm. And uh, if you say paradigm, you're going to sound uneducated, just a little clue there. A paradigm is a way of seeing. In fact, it comes from a Greek word, paradigma, which means to, to show things side by side, to contrast two different ways of, of viewing things. And all of us have paradigms from your home of origin, from the people you've been around growing up, from the business you're in. We have a way of seeing the world. And it is not always the best way. It's not always accurate. So let me give you a little illustration. So say uh, you lived in Cameroon, Africa, and there is this huge frogs they called Goliath frogs. And, and you're aware of them, and there are some fascinating things about how they reproduce and et cetera. But you're, you're familiar with frogs. And so if I show you a picture like this, what is it you see? Kids, what am, what am I hearing? Yeah, yeah. You see a frog. Obviously, you look at that picture. If somebody said to you, what's that a picture of? It's like, it's a frog. Duh. But if you just turn this at a little different angle, all of a sudden you realize it also is a picture of a horse. Now, for the most of you, you didn't see that horse at all when we had it the other direction. When you see something one way, you often don't look for any other way of seeing it. That's just how it is. And then somebody comes along and they twist it a little bit and ask you a question and maybe make some suggestions and all of a sudden you go, oh, now I can see both the frog and the horse and I can choose how I'm going to look at it. And, and I think that's a wonderful illustration of what happens in Moses' life is he has a way of seeing things. His father-in-law Jethro comes along and gives him a new paradigm, a new way of seeing and Moses has to choose what, what it is that God wants him to see. So let's go back and catch, first of all, how we're jumping out of Hebrews chapter 11. This was kind of like the highlight reel of Moses' life. It says, He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. So often we look at these Old Testament characters like that. Like, man, he chose to follow Jesus. He he decided to, to lead the people out of Israel. He led them for 40 years. And we talked about how Moses had 40-year segments of his life. The first 40 as a prince of Egypt. The second 40 as a shepherd in the desert. And then the third 40 as a leader of the Israelites. And, and it's easy for us to look at those like it was painless. It was easy. He just had something about him. He, he was just an exceptional kind of person. So obviously that's why God called him to lead and I want us to zoom in on one little part of his life, which shows a little more the process, the messy, about how he saw something in a wrong paradigm and how God helped him to adjust that. So, first of all, he has a mindset. We all have a mindset. And he had a specific mindset about leadership. And his idea of leadership is there should be one guy at the top, and clearly God had used him to announce the plagues, to hold his rod over the, the Red Sea to have it divide, and, and he was the man. And what happened is that then began to bring down into the daily life 
where everybody in this million plus people that had a conflict, that had a difficulty, wanted to come and talk to Moses and, and wanted him to say, here's what God's plan is or here's what, how I'm going to decide between two of you who are in dispute. And if you can imagine, people that are no longer in an established place of living, they're nomads, they're going with bare sustenance, food and water, they have to move all the time. You can imagine, there's a lot of conflict. When you don't know where you're going and you don't know what's going on, it's easy to take it out on the people around you. Does that sound familiar in any part of your life? So there were lots of conflicts, and therefore Moses is spending all of his time trying to settle fights. And so he, he had this mindset. Where did he get it? Well, I, I can't tell you for sure, but I'm guessing he got it from Egypt. The Pharaoh, that's the way they do things. That's the way I grew up. I, I don't even see a different way of seeing it. And what happens is God, in his love, gives him some feedback. And his feedback... <laughs> comes in the form of a father-in-law. And my brother Rex said one time, you know, God is showing me a lot of new things in my life, places I need to grow, things I need to see, and, and it's so good, except it sounds a lot like what my mom has been trying to been tell me for the last 10 years. And, and I think that we often want God to reveal something that seems easy. and Sometimes he's doing it by people that are right next to us, like maybe your family members, maybe people that you work with, maybe people that you associate with regularly. So we're going to look at how this happened because Jethro, his father-in-law, did a great job, not of criticizing, not of cutting him down, but of helping him see something differently. And so we want to learn how did Jethro do it so that if God calls us to speak truth into somebody's life, we can do it with excellence. Uh, we also want to look at Moses because we want to look at the other side of it is how do you respond when somebody says, I think you should look at that differently or there's a problem there or have you thought of this? And so the first part as we go back to the story, I want to start with chapter 18. I'm going to start reading in verse 1. It says, Now Jethro, the priest of Midian, the father-in-law of Moses, heard of everything God had done for Moses and for his people Israel and how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. So it identifies he's a priest of Midian, which is an interesting sidelight that many places in the Bible there are followers of God who are not part of the Israelite nation or, or we're not sure exactly how they knew about God. And then he is also talking about a family reunion. So it says after Moses had sent his wife Zipporah away, his father-in-law received her and her two sons, and the one son was named Gershom, which means that a foreigner in a foreign land. And the other son was Eliezer, which means God, God has helped me. And he, he named his two kids based on his relationship with God. And yet, when God called him to go down to Egypt and to face into Pharaoh and the great danger, he sent his family back home. He sent them back to Zipporah's dad. And now they've come through all of this initial uh, the plagues, the Red Sea, the first part of the desert trip, and now they've come back to the area of Mount Sinai, and so now he's going to have a family reunion. And so it says, so Moses went out to meet his father-in-law, and he bowed down and kissed him, and they greeted each other, and then he went into the tent, and Moses told his father-in-law about everything the Lord had done to Pharaoh and the Egyptians for Israel's sake, and about all the hardships that they had met along the way and how the Lord had saved them. So here's the scenario. Family reunion after a long separation. Jethro is a godly man. Jethro is his father-in-law. And in that scenario, we have this conversation that becomes a crucial conversation that changes Moses' life and changes actually things for how the Israelites operate. And I wanted you to see that first of all, he starts off with a sense of care and love and affection and, and he took care of his, his grandkids and his daughter again when Moses was on a dangerous mission. And then when he heard about all that Moses shared with him, it says Jethro was delighted to hear about all the good things that the Lord had done for Israel in rescuing them from the hand of the Egyptians. So he was just happy with him. He listened to him and he encouraged him. And then he said, praise be to the Lord who rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and of the Pharaoh and who rescued the people from the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all other gods for he did this to those who had treated Israel arrogantly. Uh, 
I want to suggest to you that people who have the most right to speak truth into somebody's lives are people who, first of all, listen well. And, and that's one of those forms of encouragement. In this time when everybody's more stressed out than usual, yeah, we need encouragement. We need to listen to each other and, and, and essentially say, wow, that's great, and God's working, and, and, and now that your story has helped me have more faith in God, and, and we can share that together. And so he begins with saying, what's right? He begins with saying, I care about you. He begins with that part of the relationship. And then, as the story unfolds, he also has another conversation. So he finds himself in a place where he sees Moses doing something that he doesn't think is going to work. So he has to decide how to handle that, and he challenges him in a very powerful way. It says, The next day Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people, and they stood around him from morning till evening. So what do you do in the desert when you got nothing else to do? Apparently, you fight and have disputes, and then you want to come to the man, to Moses, and he's going to sit there in his chair, and he's going to tell you what God's plan is. Uh, this is the same Moses who received the Ten Commandments and a whole lot more. This is the same Moses who wrote all of the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. And so he is well-versed in what God's plan is for them. And you think about how difficult that must be. We have all of God's word given to us with so many stories and the thoughts of God and what is morally correct and what is, what is really spiritual. And you realize that they not only didn't have this, but they had been raised in Egypt and they had uh, all kinds of mixed messages that they had received. And so Moses had to straighten him out. And so he's doing that all day long, day after day after day. And so Jethro is sitting there watching this going on. And it says, when his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, what is this that you're doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge while all these people stand around you from morning till evening? <laughs> That's a, it's another good principle. Um, ask a question before you make a statement. Uh, sometimes we are bursting with great advice because we've got such great ideas and everybody ought to listen to us. And you don't realize that your idea won't work because you really don't know the situation. And so he pauses and he says, let, let me ask you, what, what's going on there? Why do you do this? And Moses answered him, because the people come to me to seek God's will. And whenever they have a dispute, it's brought to me and I decide between the parties and I inform them of God's decrees and God's instructions. You see, the, the law that Moses eventually wrote down it not only included the relationship with God laws, it talked about how they prepared their food, about how they ran their schedule, about the holiday calendar. It, it talked about disputes and, and finances and all kinds of stuff. And they had to come and he said, you know, I'm, I'm trying to tell him what God wants. So I think you can hear there that Moses has a right heart and a right attitude. This isn't an ego thing. This isn't a control thing. That, that he really wants to help people know how to follow God. And yet, the, the question that he asked him is, why do you alone do that? And so, then Jethro steps in and he says, let's have a little conversation. I don't know how you feel when somebody says, can I talk to you about something? I don't know if when your wife or husband says, can we discuss that? But I know the natural response for me is, I get a little defensive, like, uh-oh, what, what am I in trouble for? What are you going to try to tell me? How are you going to try to control me? And we often have this defensiveness that comes up. And, and first of all, Jethro just says to him, what you're doing is not good. I think your heart's right. I know you care about these people. I think God's called you here. I'm not challenging any of that. Your methodology, there's a problem there. And then he goes on and he says, I'm going to tell you, first of all, it's a problem. Uh, I, I know that I have a compassionate heart for people and sometimes when I'm trying to bring correction, my wife was sitting there one day after I'd talked with somebody and she said, I think you were so nice they didn't know what you said. So I, I have to push myself to be a little more clear. Like, this is a problem. I don't think you're going to be able to continue in, in serving in the place you are serving if you're continuing in this behavior or whatever. So he was clear and then he went on and he was caring and he said, you and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. 
You cannot handle it alone. See, the paradigm of Moses is God called me, I'm the man, I've got to do this alone. That was his problem. And Jethro looks at that and he says, are you kidding me? How long do you think you can stand there, or sit there, (laughs) he at least had a chair, while these people come to you day after day, hour after hour, 12, 13 hours a day, you're listening to people gripe and complain and the disputes and the the hardship. How how long do you think that's really going to work for you? And and I'm sure that (laughs) as soon as he said that, Moses was like, yeah, it's a lot. I remember Pastor Ed said to me some years ago in ministry when we were right at a, at a crucial change, he's, he said a very simple statement. He said, ministry is hard, but it shouldn't be this hard. And I realized that I just kept adapting and adapting and trying to work harder and trying to work around it. And I needed to address some things and I needed to, to step into some things. And Ed said, it shouldn't be this hard. And there was like a little light bulb in my head. <laughs> You're right. It shouldn't be this hard. One little sentence said caringly and in love. And so Jethro's like, man, this is a marathon. You're you're trying to run it like a like a sprint, and you can't you can't sustain this. The strain will kill you. And besides that, it's killing the people. And then he goes on and he does the third part, which is what a lot of people don't do. He says, Here's something you might want to try. And he says it graciously. He says, I'll I'll give you this idea and and you see if that's the Lord's will for you. He, he doesn't say it's not a control issue. See, I know that we all like to, to have our opinions, and we often want to air them and tell people what they should do, or we talk about people because they're doing stuff we don't think they should do. And you know, criticism and gossip and all those ugly things, and let me tell you, right now there's a lot of ugliness out there. They could be totally replaced by Honestly and caringly, clearly talking with somebody to them, not about them, coming along and showing your heart for them, and then maybe having some very clear and constructive ideas. And, and the way that Jethro says it is he doesn't say, you better do this. In fact, he's the father-in-law. He's going to give this idea, and then he's going to go back home. It, it's not self-serving. He's not trying to get anything out of it. He's just saying, for what it's worth, here's, can I give you a bit of advice? And if you've been to Love and Logic, you recognize that phrase. Can I give you a little bit of advice? And so here's what he says to him. Teach them his decrees and instructions and show them the way that they are to live and how they are to behave. Moses, you're absolutely right. God has spoken to you. Your top priority is that you are supposed to tell them God's will and God's plan. And you only are the one that can do that. So here's one of the leadership principles for those who are in a position of leadership is make as a priority the things that only you can do. I, I have all kinds of skills that I have used over the years in church life and in, in reaching out to our community. I can't sustain and do all of them all the time. There are some things I used to do that other people are doing far better than I could do. And I'm trying to do what only I can do and what is best for me to do. So he says... You teach him, teach all the people. Don't just handle the problems. Have the whole group understand what is going to, what, what God's will is and help them to do things right beforehand instead of just solving problems afterwards. And, and here's the important principle. He says, I want you to train them instead of just decide what the conflict is over. And it reminds me in our own home, and there was a time as Jen was trying to train our girls especially to pick up their rooms and their clothes and take care of them. And one of our daughters, who shall remain nameless, her way of cleaning a room was to take all the clothes that she'd tried on all week and that were sitting all over and just put them all in the laundry. Then they were clean. Then she could go do whatever she wanted to do. And mom's like, oh, oh, no, that's not going to happen. I think it's time for you to begin doing your own laundry. And so we begin to have a line in our house that when you get to a certain age, you start doing your own laundry. Well, then as we have three girls and as the laundry system became more complex, you'd have somebody that would do their laundry and then leave it in the washing machine and nobody else could do their laundry because they hadn't taken care of it. And so Jan had a little little conference with him. She said, if you don't get your laundry done in this four-hour block of time that I'm giving you, then the next time you need to do your laundry, we're going to go to the laundromat and you're going to pay with your money 
And you're going to stay there while your clothes are washed and while your clothes are dried. Is that clear? Here's the, here's the goal. Here's the consequence. Here's how it's going to happen. And you know, you say to yourself, that's a great idea. But you know what? It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of intentionality. And for the record, we only had to do that once. Because that is training. So he says, yes, you need to teach and train them. And then he says, you also need to hand off that responsibility. Select men from the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain. They've got a spiritual heart. They've got integrity. And then appoint them. Hand over some of your work, Moses. Appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. You think, man, this guy had some pretty uh, specific advice. I think all day long while he was watching Moses sit there and answer all these disputes, he was thinking, how is this going to work? And I I don't know what level of leader Jethro was, but this is high-level leadership thinking. Some people are qualified to lead a thousand. And if you have over a million people, you need quite a few of those. Some people are qualified maybe to lead hundreds. Some people are qualified maybe to lead 50s. And I love it that it goes down to 10s. Remember they had a lot of kids? That's basically your family. So he was saying, find different levels of leadership that people have or potential that people have and lead them into, train them to begin to take responsibility for a specific group of people. My definition of the beginning of starting to develop what God's called you to do is that you begin to take responsibility for something. God says, I want you to step in, and you say, okay, I'll step in this far. And so he was saying, here's the plan. I want you to step into this and give your leadership to others. And then he says, and what happens is you'll have them serve as judges for the people at all times, not around one chair, one day, He said, but have them bring every difficult case to you. So it doesn't take much thinking to realize, so if the guy who's leading a group of 10, if this is too difficult, it goes to the guy who leads 50 or it goes to the guy who leads 100. And then he says, the simple cases they can decide for themselves. That's also part of their training. And then he says, that will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. Let me tell you how not to kill yourself. You're gonna hand off some of this responsibility And they're going to be trained, the people's needs will be met, and here's the plan. Now, I know that as soon as I start talking about taking responsibility and leading, some of you kind of click out. Some of you are thinking, well, that's not me. And you know what? I think that's interesting. There's there's some difficulties that we have in handing off leadership. Sometimes the difficulty is for the person who is already a leader. I want to hang on to control, or they won't do it as well, or they don't have enough experience, or whatever the I don't think they've got enough is. But quite often, the the problem is on the other side. People think, I don't have enough. I don't have the background. I don't have the knowledge. I'm too old. I'm too young. I'm too whatever. So when God begins to call them to step in and take responsibility for something, it's easy for you to kick out and say, that's not me which isn't that interesting. That's exactly Moses' story. So here's the guy who's leading this whole group of people. Where did he start last week when God said, I have a job for you? His first job was, his first statement was, I can't do it. I'm the wrong person. You got the wrong number. I'm incapable. I, I don't, I, I can't speak well. And, and I think the problem with, that Moses had is the same problem maybe you have. As you have a little picture that says, If you're really going to be a godly leader, then you have to be somebody who's ready to speak eloquently to a group, uh, to lead lots of people, to to be available to hold on to a group and to shepherd them through all kinds of difficult things. You have this ideal box that says, here's the perfect leader, and that's not me. That's exactly what Moses thought. And now God has developed him through this process, and now he's saying to Moses, now what you've learned... I want you to pass on. Moses, I want you to be people helping people find and follow Jesus. The same thing that we are trying to help you get involved in. That's what God was working with Moses on. And I want to tell you, both the current leaders and the people who God is developing have to learn to see a new paradigm. They have to trust that God is at work 
and that this is in fact going to be what actually gets us to doing God's will in a sustainable way. So, several years ago, about eight years ago, we were in a series called Catalyst, and we were talking about what are those things that catalyze your growth? What are the, the things that help you grow spiritually? And one of those things was serving God, getting involved somewhere, taking responsibility, doing something where you are committing to doing something for the Lord, stepping out of your comfort zone. And I remember after that service on Saturday night, uh, there was several people wanted to talk to me, and there was this young guy came up, and his wife was nearby, and and he was just obviously moved. He'd been crying, and he said, thank you so much for that message. While I was sitting there, God just tapped me on the shoulder and said, you need to get involved. And he said, Paul, I'm here to serve the Lord. However, I'm willing to volunteer. Wherever you need me, I'm ready. I just want you to know that. And that young man was named Jason Howell. And I didn't know much about him at the time. He was a nice guy. He was clearly sincere. God had moved his heart. But I knew he'd had some drug history, and I didn't know all the story about it. And, and he had a young wife, and I knew that she was a, a pastor's daughter, and I knew that there had been some church hurts there. And I thought, yeah, maybe this will be an awesome development, but yeah, I don't know. You know, it's easy for us to see people's problems instead of their potential. And yet God clearly moved in this young man, and the exciting story is God has been taking him step by step by step through a leadership growth process. And not everybody who's called to be a leader is going to end up on staff, but Jason and Shaughnessy were called then to serve in green, and they're going to tell you a little bit of their story. Hi, my name's Jason. And I'm Shaughnessy. We're the house. We have three kids, and I often get them mixed up. So what are their names? Emberlyn, Asher, and Audra. Uh, thank you. Um, and our story, uh, before we were married, we were actually both followers of Christ, but we had very different backgrounds. I was not raised in the church. and I come from a family of pastors. In fact, my great-grandfather, Claude Wells, was a pastor down here in Myrtle Creek. Yeah, and so uh, we, we began uh, to join Family Church right about the time that the Green Campus opened in 2013. And uh, we quickly felt called and pulled by God in our hearts to get on mission, to join him in what he was doing at Family Church. And uh, we, we joined in the student ministry. Um, you did. Took a little bit for me. Yeah, it took a little coaxing. I remember those conversations. But after a few weeks, we were both serving as a team in the student ministry at the Green Campus. And uh, we did that for the last seven years. And at one point, we, we became the leaders. Uh, we were over the ministry and kind of led the charge there. And, and we saw amazing things happen. Uh, students' lives transformed, parents learning how to disciple their kids, and we got to do a lot of fun stuff, too. There was one point where I got to watch a student eat a mayonnaise-filled donut. Yes, and my favorite was when we played a game throwing squids around. Yeah, ultimate squiz beat. Uh, <laughs> you should try it. But uh, we had a lot of fun, and we saw God do some amazing things in the hearts and the lives of teenagers at the Green Campus over the last seven years. And uh, just like we felt called to, to join that ministry, over the last year we felt pulled and called by God again to, uh, to make a change. And at first, I didn't want to. I, I said, no, God. And he kept pressing in. And, and through some prayer and some, some wise counsel, um, we didn't expect this, but we are so excited to join uh, South Amqua in what God is already doing down there. And uh, our first official day is going to be August 2nd, so it's coming up pretty quick, and we can't wait to get to know more of the people down there and join them um, in serving that community. Isn't that an exciting story? You know what's exciting for me, having been here at Family Church a long time, is to watch how many people God has brought into the church fellowship, come to a relationship with himself, have grown through the process of learning to lead themselves, uh, repairing their marriage, learning to, to raise their kids or whatever stage they're at. And then slowly but surely, God calls them into becoming a life group leader or, or helping with a, a ministry with children or whatever that is. And, and the joy that I've gotten to see is people who thought that they could not do anything are now doing incredible things. Moses, who said, I'm not eloquent, is now leading a whole nation. And now God's saying to him, use what you've learned to go back and to help people 
who maybe, you know, they're like a capacity of 10. <laughs> they, could, they can barely lead themselves, but maybe they can lead a few more. And let them go through that process of developing. Because sometimes the blindness, the paradigm that's missing is for the leaders who are currently leading to see the potential in those who God is calling. Many, many more times, I think the, the paradigm shift needs to be with you. Because you've got those blocks in your head that say, I can't do it because. I'm not qualified because. I don't think that would work because. And let me just challenge you to quit looking at the frog. <laughs> Begin to see a different picture. Begin to see that God is so powerful that he could use even you. And begin to listen to where he wants you to, to step in and to take some responsibility and, and to begin to have an influence. Because see, bottom line, leadership is not about a position, it's about influence. It's about how you respond in your life group. It's how, maybe how you reach out to your neighbors, maybe even inviting some neighbor kids to come to your backyard for VBX. It, it is all kinds of different ways in which you can begin caring about people and speaking truth into their life. And if there's anything we can learn out of this story of Moses is when you need to challenge somebody, you need to speak the truth in love, and I'll add, with wisdom. And then the second part of it is the humility that Moses showed because Moses made some changes. He had a paradigm from Egypt. He had a paradigm that he was used to. He had a paradigm that was sort of working. God, through Jethro, his father-in-law, his family member, gave him a new paradigm and said, you need to focus your attention not on sitting there all day long answering alone. You need to begin to train and to choose and to appoint other people that can take the load with you, that can bear the strain with you. And Moses, in humility, listened. Now, sometimes when people approach you and challenge you and, and talk to you, when they say, we need to have a talk, sometimes they don't do it very well. They're not like Jethro. They, they don't make it clear and caring, and, and sometimes they don't even have any suggestions for, for how you can, you can actually put it into practice. So let me caution you. Even when somebody doesn't do it well, even when you're not exactly sure of their motives, sometimes God is speaking through them, and you need to ask yourself the question, is it true? Is this something I need to hear? I remember when we first started talking about having baptisms in the service, and I was very resistant to that. I loved the way we did our baptisms, where people got to share their stories, and, and they had supporters that came, sometimes from other churches that, that could come because we had them on Sunday afternoons. And, and so I was resistant to that, and the more I listened, and the more I thought about it, and the more I tried to see a different paradigm, I could see how how absolutely encouraging it would be to the whole church family to watch people get baptized. But, but I had some real hesitations. But, you know, over time, I began to think that God was leading us that way, and we began to start asking the question, how do we do this instead of what's wrong with it? And there have been so many places in my life where, where I saw things a certain way, and God used loving people around me to say, there's a different way of seeing that. And you know what they call that? That's called growth. If you can't look back and see how you used to be wrong, then you're probably still stuck there. If you can't look back and see that you used to be foolish, then I'm afraid you're still there. So seeing a new paradigm is the process of spiritual growth. You see things differently. And then he changed his attitude, and shared his leadership. And it goes on to say, he listened to his father-in-law and he did everything he said. He chose capable men from all of Israel and he made them leaders of the people, officials over thousands and hundreds and fifties and tens, and they served as judges for the people at all times. The difficult cases they brought to Moses, but the simple ones they decided for themselves. <laughs> when I read that, I'm thinking, okay, Moses, there's no slam dunks for you anymore. You get nothing but the Supreme Court cases. But it was the way it was supposed to be. And you know what's interesting? It became not only the the way in which Israel governed, but it also became kind of a picture in which the New Testament church, that everywhere Paul went, he led people to Christ, and then he appointed elders. He appointed leaders for every local assembly. He broke it down. Paul was the, the roving missionary leader, but every person in the New Testament is supposed to be lovingly cared for by 
an elder or somebody who the elder appoints. And it's a picture that goes from Moses all the way down to today. So I don't know what this does with your life. I don't know where your paradigm needs to shift. Maybe it's somebody that you need to see differently because all you've seen is their problems and God wants you to see their potential. And he wants you maybe to challenge them and speak into their life and speak the truth in love, in wisdom. Maybe he's challenging you. Just like Jason felt like when he listened to that service about pouring your life out for Christ and there's nothing that matters more than that. And maybe you've been self-absorbed or you've been focused on what you are doing and, and God wants to give you a different way of seeing. He wants to show you what he can do in your life and how he wants to make you people helping people find and follow Jesus. And so I guess this is the moment where you begin to say, well, God, what are you saying to me? What is it that I need to do to change the paradigm, change my perspective? And I'm gonna pray and I want you to say, Holy Spirit, if there's something that I'm seeing wrongly that I'm wrestling with right now, I give you permission to straighten out my paradigm. Let's pray. God, I thank you for Jason and Shaughnessy and for the joy of watching them develop from those first fledgling steps to where they're now leading a campus. God, I thank you for many other stories like that of people who are not on staff but who've grown in their development and leading themselves and leading others. And I ask that by your spirit, you would use this weekend to be such a moment in somebody's life that they would realize that they've been sitting, they've been absorbed in themselves, they've been focused on the problems, they've been angry at the world. And you want them to get up off the couch and get out there and do something to make a difference for you. And I pray that right now you would be knocking on their heart and say, you've been thinking it's all about you, but it's not that God still has a plan and a purpose and he's inviting you to be part of it. He's inviting you to serve and to learn and to listen and to grow. And so God, in the quietness of this moment, by your Holy Spirit, would you challenge us at how we see others, how we see ourselves, how we see what you've called us to do. In Jesus' name. like you to take a moment and discuss uh, whatever setting you're in. You can decide what's appropriate, but I think it's really a helpful thing. Several people have said, you know, this discussion idea at the end of messages has really been helpful. So I want you to share a story of someone who spoke truth into your life. Maybe it was somebody who encouraged you when you were down. Maybe it was you were just wrong-headed about something. You were stubborn. You were looking at things wrong, and somebody came along, and, and they were able to speak truth in a way that revolutionized your life. And, and I want you just to share that, to review for yourself and also to, to share with other people about how this has made such a difference in your life. So take a few moments, let this lesson sink into you and share it with somebody else. Thanks for coming.